Welcome to Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. On Digging Deeper, we have in-depth discussions with extension and industry experts about those important landscape topics. Tonight, we are talking about risky trees, that risky business, with John Fesh. And John, of course, is a great extension educator in Douglas Sarpy County and does a fabulous job with tree risk assessment. So John, welcome to the program. We are looking forward to hearing you tell us what to do and not to do with those risky trees. And let's start with what is somebody, what does somebody have to do to know how to assess trees for risk? What do you have to do for that? Well, I had to go through lots of training <laughs> and lots of experience. You know, they talk about 10,000 hours in any given field. And that's what I feel it's been for me as a kind of a career long journey of being able to gain a, some degree of experience and credibility in, in learning how to address a tree risk. There's very complicated, there's a lot of factors that go into it. I became a certified arborist through the International Society of Arboriculture. And then I went through an extensive training class with um, actually the, <laughs> the Pacific Northwest chapter up in Seattle was kind of the leading edge at that time. And then it became more mainstream and became certified as a tree risk assessor here in Nebraska. Well, so how many trees do you actually assess per week? <laughs> well, it really varies. And it's really driven by our clients and, and what they really want and, and their need for it. But on average, uh, I spend a, a morning or an afternoon a week looking at it. You have to balance it with all the other things you do for the university. Um, but I think it, it really helps to keep your skills sharp to do it frequently and um, you have to kind of reach a, a sweet spot with it, but you, you do it and you stay fresh with it. All right, so John, let's, let's go into exactly what you have to do to identify defects and those kinds of things in, in risky tree sorts of business. And let's start with, I think you gave a list of the considerations that are really important. So let's start with that and see how that goes. And Sure. The the first consideration is that which it could fall on if it, if it fails, uh, either a branch or the whole tree. We talk about a tree part, and a tree part can be a branch, uh, a fruit, or the whole tree. And so it just depends. And uh, it really, it's the proximity to a potential target. And a target is a person or something of value. So a, a target could be a fence. Um, here it's a gazebo. Um, and obviously there could be people lounging and having morning tea by the gazebo. <laughs> um, here the entrance to a condominium complex. And so anytime you have a tree within close proximity to a target, that becomes an issue. So John, um, let me bring up- uh, Relative. Yeah, well, and wow, look at that one. So yeah. it looks like several of these, we see this a lot, uh, certainly in all sorts of landscapes. People, people want to save that big, great tree, and then yeah. they do all this construction around it. So is that one of the things that you really consider in terms of being right next, you know, the target itself? Here's this big old tree that maybe was compromised anyway during the construction process? We do. So the first one is that potential target. The second one are the site conditions. Mm -hmm. and site conditions could mean a, a compacted soil or a soil that has been recently had the soil disturbed with construction or perhaps an adjoining property and the activities on the adjoining property. There's a famous one that I'm aware of there where there's a uh, sort of a lumber yard next door. Well, the activities there make a big difference. Here's the excavation around this tree. And, uh, you know, Kim, you and I don't like these types of things, these planter boxes that go around trees. <laughs> right. And, cutting roots and piling up soil around a tree trunk, not very good. So these are illustrations of site conditions that you should be concerned about. Um, this one's a little better in that, yes, it's a, it's a tree that is in with striking distance of the target, but at least there's a lot of pervious surface, mm -hmm. a lot of that water uh, can soak into and oxygen can exchange with. Um, of course, in the very foreground, there's a sidewalk and a driveway to be concerned about. So you really have to take a lot of factors into consideration. 
So overhaul tree health, I think, has to be really, really important here too, John, right? And that's something we, we get a lot of questions on that. We talk about it all the time. How do you actually assess overall tree health in figuring out uh, the, the uh, risk? So we're looking for reasonable growth, not excessive growth, not stunted growth. You're kind of looking for, again, a sweet spot there. Reasonably green color, not excessively so. In this situation, I'm sure that you've shown this type of photo on backyard farmer quite a bit. This is iron chlorosis in a pin oak. Um, if you have this, the tree is stressed. And so the overall tree health is a problem in addition to whatever defects that the tree might have. Um, so it's the, the obvious problems uh, as well as the, the lack of a problem that become important in overall tree health. So I, I would think too, John, that, you know, obviously I assume that you do some of the tree risk assessment in the winter months when you don't have, or at least when, when plants are uh, dormant. How do you, what do you look at in terms of the trunk or the bark or the branches that gives you an indication of tree health? Anything in particular come to mind on that? One of the things we're looking for are the amount of growth a tree produce and is it, is it appropriate for that species? Mm -hmm. um, some trees put out more growth than others. And so a silver maple, maybe it put out 12 inches of growth in a, year, a year's time. And you can kind of tell by comparing the bundle scars and where those are in year one, year two, year three. Uh, and also, um, you know, is the growth in a spiraling direction or is it headed in the right trajectory? You pretty much just have to separate all deciduous leaves from the picture because they're not there to give you clues. But that might be a better time to focus more on conifers or evergreens because they're going to look pretty much the same in the winter as they do in the summer. Um, and you tend to spend a little bit more time looking at the bark and the, the places that sometimes the canopy of the tree will cover. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is more difficult in the winter time to look at trees and assess tree health and tree risk assessment, but it also can give you a little bit of an advantage being able to see some of the tree parts that aren't always available to look at in the summer. So you, you mentioned conifers. Do you, do you find um, more or less deciduous trees that you have to assess risk? Is, is it usually one or the other or does it make any difference? You know, it really doesn't make that much difference, Kim. It's about the same um, mm -hmm. because any of the tree risk defects can be present on both. Um, I, I guess if I, just from experience in doing this a while, I see a few more on deciduous trees, but I certainly see quite a few on, on evergreens as well. All right, so we wanna make sure that you are watching us on Facebook, giving us all that great feedback, telling us whether you like what we're talking about, the subject matter, is it something that interests you? Are you learning from what we are telling you? Or are you being entertained? Because those kind of go hand in hand. So make sure you respond to us. We love to do this, but we love to hear from you. All right, John, uh, are you ready to actually talk about the various defects that these trees can have? Let's hear some of that conversation. Sure, and there are a number of them. There are probably a dozen at least that I always look for. The first are cracks, I, and a wise uh, tree climber in uh, New Hampshire once taught me about tree cracks, and it's the physical separation of bark, sapwood, and sometimes heartwood. And oh my gosh, this thing could come down at just about any time. And uh, again, a tree climber knows uh, what a safe tree is to climb and what a tree, a tree he, he or she would not climb. Um, and so a crack like this is, is certainly a red flag. Um, big crack here, this is about almost in the point of imminent failure. Um, this is after a storm and obviously there's been a big separation of uh, bark wood and sapwood and certainly even heartwood. Wow. Yeah, that, that just looks like, don't, don't even come close to standing underneath that one. So what else are you looking at, John? What, what else do we see for defects that well, come to mind? Well, we see cracks in, bar in branches like we've just seen. Then we also see cracks in trunks. Mm -hmm. and again, that's a big issue uh, because where a crack in a trunk like this, you don't really know. It's kind of hard to tell exactly how far that goes in. Sometimes it's easier on a branch. With a trunk, sometimes more of that tissue is hidden. The factor of one and a half comes into play here 
in that the size of the part, generally we think about what is one and a half times the distance of that part away from the part. So falling on a target, we always think about the landing zone uh, as sort of one and a half times the size of the part. The same kind of consideration here. Now here, there's not much of a target present. And really by definition, without a target, there is no risk. <laughs> So you have to really keep all, see how complicated this can get. Um, if there's another, yeah. I guess you could say that is a target if it's a tree of value, but um, if there's no people, there's no fence, there's no driveway, there's no house. Right. But there might I mean, be somebody walking still in their my dog. mind a defect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. these last two pictures, John, um, it appears as though one thing that contributes to risk later in a tree's life is poor management practices when they're young, because it looked like both of these had what we typically would call included bark, where rather than growing out, the bark is doing this, kind of like an ingrown toenail. Is that kind of a correct assumption there? It is, and uh, generally pruning could have, good pruning in early life. Uh, we have some examples of that coming up here. Um, good, good pruning uh, in early in the tree's life within the first few years would have corrected that and prevented that, that damage so, or that potential problem. Yeah. You know, if you see the trunk, we often talk about girdling roots, Kim. I think that's one of our favorite things to talk about. Sure. And that's up in the next slide or two, but also just how that tree trunk goes in the ground. I always look for flat sides. And this photo I like because it shows both. We see the flat side on the left side there. Um, and when you see a flat side, that's it's flat for a reason. It's supposed to kind of flare out, um, but it, maybe there was some basal damage from a lawnmower or it was planted too deeply um, or both. <laughs> and the roots have been responding by sort of wrapping themselves around the trunk. And you can see the same thing here again, flat sided basal decay and girdling roots. Oh boy, yeah sort of a, a, a perfect triad of things for disaster in the, in the long run. Yeah. So what else, John? What else do you think of in terms of defects? Or are you ready to talk about pruning? Well, what you were talking about before, uh, rubbing branches, They're not necessarily co-dominant branches, mm -hmm. but when they are close together and they start rubbing on each other, they injure each other. And mm -hmm. um, again, some pruning definitely needs to take place there to remove one or the other. And you're always looking for architecture. You want to take out one that's growing outward rather than inward. Um, typically, you want to take out the smaller of the two branches that are crossing each other or rubbing. Mm -hmm. And just early on in the tree's life, and here you can see this, um, you have to make a decision. You're going to have to probably take out at least one, maybe two of these branches. Um, the smaller, the better. The more outward growing, you want to leave straight up. Um, if it's, if it is the leader, it's great. But if it's competing with the leader, like it kind of looks like it is here, then it's not so great. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, in my head, my druthers, I would have made this pruning decision even earlier in this tree's life, but for sure something needs to be happening now. Right. And, you know, I do think John, that a, a part of, a part of those pruning decisions is, um, people, people are really not aware of how the tree is growing because they don't pay any attention to it. It's a tree, it's shading their, their yard or, you know, it's the place where the swing is. They don't, they don't realize that each one of those branches every year is increasing in girth. And, you know, I kind of liken it to a python. All of a sudden you're, you know, <laughs> you're, you're like that with it. Yeah. So it's a good analogy. I, I like that analogy. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So what else yeah. do you want to, oh, you want to bring Let's up? keep going with sure. the co-dominant leader thing that you brought up. We've got some more photos of that. Good. When you have when you have a V like this, mm -hmm. uh, it's not for victory. Um, <laughs> they start competing with each other and they start pushing on each other. Mm -hmm. And it happens one of them is going to lose, and and in this case they both lose because uh, you see this a lot with these clump birches. They're beautiful, great architecture, great design great appearance in the landscape, but eventually they usually lead to problems like this. And the bark is included, they're pushing, they're, they're causing problems in storms, and usually the result is disappointing. So this tree, uh, actually I heard later from the homeowner had to be removed. Here you see it a little bit sooner in the silver maple where they're pushing, I think it may be a red maple. 
Or, or maybe it's no, one of those other. autumn blaze maples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Freeman maple, yeah, where they're pushing on each other like that. Again, right. not something you want. You want to take care of this as soon as possible. Wow, yeah. And I, aren't lindens sort of a classic for co-dominant leaders when they're young? Lindens definitely are classic. Now, yeah. this is the stage where you want to take care of that. Right. So you can see where this would be removed about an inch and a quarter in diameter, not much damage. Um, you can see kind of a warty growth there between the two branches. Mm -hmm. That's called bark ridge. And that's exactly just to the right of that. You would take the smaller of those two branches off mm -hmm. and it would very easily without any damage to the, well, that without much damage to the tree and certainly for the better good and the long, long life of the tree. This is that stage. Right. And, and that would mean that you would not probably have to come back out and do a tree risk assessment on this one 10 years from now. You're probably right. <laughs> You're right. probably right. right. Yeah. In addition to cracks, the classic one is decay in the trunk. Um, mm -hmm. I remember your friend and mine, Dave Muter, used to talk about uh, decay in the trunk or mm -hmm. rot. It's, it was another name we used to use. But that was one of the first things. And here you can see this. I did this inspection. And um, we've got some damage, but you, you can sometimes take a mallet like you would put hubcaps onto a car with and tap the trunk. You don't always get a good feel for it, but if you do, you, that helps to confirm it. And it, boy, this was just hollow inside, like a, like a guitar is hollow on, inside. Wow. And that, that outer shell of the bark is not very thick, maybe three inches thick. Wow. Before you on the air, we were trying to remember what that term was. It's the outer shell. Here's the <laughs> extensive decay in the trunk. Yeah. And uh, I, I would recommend pruning this tree, but only one pruning cut, and that would be near the turf. <laughs> exactly. That three Not inch. much uh, you can do with that. Extensive decay there in the trunk. No. And really, really problematic. Right. Easy decision are leaning trees. Mm -hmm. um, now, these can lean for good reasons, because they're trying to orient themselves towards the sun. I guess classically that's called phototropism, and it's just a, a plant growing towards the sun. You see that in house plants a lot. But if a tree is leaning like this. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, push up of soil on the left side, that's an automatic removal. Yeah. Um, and the first, tree is very dangerous. The first small child that wants to uh, climb yeah. that one is gonna be enough yeah. weight to pull it right out of the ground. Wow. Exactly. And this is the same tree, but just further back. And you can see, you know, the target here is the street. Right. And if it's a if it's a frequently occupied street, then it becomes very problematic. Oh, totally. And, you know, we've had so many of these storms recently where they pop up out of nowhere and the wind is 80 miles an hour, just like that with these trees. But yeah. Terrible. Another, another classic uh, no, no are topped trees. We talk about this um, commonly. And I hope that most of our viewers know that you don't top trees, but you still see these trees like this all the time in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And when you top a tree, you've really opened up the tree to a lot of internal decay problems. Plus, you can see just in the color of the, of the wood there, darker and lighter, the lighter on the top being the new growth that just inevitably re-sprouts re from mm -hmm. bedded buds. And um, that wood is not strongly attached to the limbs below. Right. In fact, weakly attached. It's only attached in that outer ring of growth, that outer one, one year's growth of sapwood. That's it. And so it's not organically knit down into the heartwood and it's very weak. And so oh, that becomes dear. <laughs> here's a uh, real <laughs> hatchet job. But you can see, you can really butcher a tree and it will still grow back. Yeah. The is it will grow back very weakly and is certainly a, uh, a hazard. Well, and I see another one in the background there that uh, apparently yeah. had quite a haircut too. So Yeah, this is uh, a bad tree pruning 101. Um, and then kind of the opposite is our next example, and that is just the opposite. It's where you cut all the lower limbs off, and that's called an elevation. Oh, boy. Now, it's okay if you kind of do it one limb at a time, just enough to get the mower underneath the tree, that kind of thing. But when you take all of the lower limbs off, um, as you have here, and you can see just a recent removal, then the tree becomes very uh, susceptible to wind throw. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, some classic German physicists have shown this through their research, that if you look at a tree that is fully leafed, it is much able to 
much more able to diffuse the energy of a storm than a tree like this. Sure, yeah. A greater lever, greater leverage is gonna cause more damage and more potential limbs will break out and more potential for the whole tree to topple. Wow, yeah, and lots of targets So we don't there. recommend this at all. This is bad, yeah, very bad. Don't just cut all the lower limbs off. Sometimes you'll hear, see people say, well, I can make it look like an umbrella underneath. No, you don't, you, you don't want that. It's yeah. not. It's not an umbrella. It's not like something you buy for your patio. It's a living, breathing organism. You, you certainly don't want that. Right. We have about a minute, John. Do you want to leave our audience with any cautionary notes or one really good, bad, fun, awful story about one you've looked at? I think I want to go back to what you said earlier, and that's uh, inspect the tree. Go out and look for something unusual or something that you have a question about. And then you can always take a photo of that. We all have iPhone, Samsung, Galaxy phones. Snap a picture, send it to your local educator or the backyard farmer, and just get a first glimpse. Now, we certainly can't make any recommendations based off a photo, but it's a first glimpse. And um, if something looks a bit askew, please ask us about that because right. we want to help you, and that's what, that's what we're there to do. Excellent. Well, that is all the time we have for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. And we want to say thanks to John Fesch for coming in and talking to us today about all those trees that we really want to keep, but probably shouldn't. We will be back next time with another in-depth discussion. Do be sure to watch Backyard Farmer Live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central on Nebraska Public Media. Thank you for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer.